right. It's more truth up front. <laughs> This is a, a new one in our fifth annual conference. It's the first one that we've hosted here, primarily here at uh, Wellspring Bible Fellowship. So it's a blessing. Now that I'm up here running the church, Pastor Ryan's here running the church, and Pastor Brian's on board, and he's the pastor here. So, man, it's just a, a blessing to be able to be here. We, we thought, why, why do it anywhere else when most of the people that are speaking here are at this church? Amen. And even since Pastor Chuck will drive a little hour or less or so going down. Yeah. But uh, had a great opening day yesterday. Did a little uh, preemptive work down at uh, Southern Oregon University, and got to do some uh, witness out at the abortion mill. A lot of seeds planted. A lot of good work done. And uh, got to hear Pastor Parker Reardon down at Grace Bible Church down in Talent give a good message last night. And uh, got to see the encouragement of them and him encouraging his body to move more forward in evangelism and getting the gospel out to the people in their community, so that was a real blessing. So we kind of kicked everything off there, and now we're kicking off the teaching sessions here at Wellspring with our brother worship leader, David Pallison. So he's kind of taking double duty tonight. He's going to help with Pastor Brian lead worship for us, and then we'll get into his teaching, and his teaching is called, and I, I stole it mostly, I just tried to make it sound Baptist with the three W's, but it's evangelism where worship is wanting. So I had to have the alliteration. But I basically stole from John Piper's title on missions where worship is wanting, or missions where worship is lacking, whatever he called it. But uh, I felt, wow, that's appropriate. What better man than a guy who's become passionate for evangelism and has already been passionate for years about worshiping the Lord and wanting to bring those two together. I thought, couldn't think of a better person to do it. So let's join together in worship here for a bit, and then He'll get into the teaching, but before we do any of that, let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this night. I thank you for bringing us all here. What a blessed day we've had to go out and to spend some time today in the fields of lost souls, passing out gospel tracts, preaching the gospel, having conversations, holding up signs and banners, any way we could to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that some of those people that you have given hearts to believe that they would be good soil upon which the seed fell, and that it would go down, bear fruit by bearing first a strong root, and growing up and providing 30, 60, and 100 fold for your glory. I pray you would do a mighty work in and through each and every person tonight. Equip us all the more to go into those fields, to do that which pleases you. Lord, we ask for that blessing, we ask for it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.
Uh, let's uh, flip to Matthew 28, if you can imagine it. Flip, tap, whatever you need to do. Get the Word of God before your eyes this evening, afternoon, whatever you call this weird part of the day. Matthew 28, we're going to start back in verse 16. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. Before I get rolling here, let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, we need you. We need your word. We need your word to shape how we think. We need it to shape how we feel. We need to shape every part of us in order that we may worship you with all of our being. 
So Lord, just pray that you would point our eyes to you tonight as we need to continually remember why we do what we do. Lord, we just uh, we want to love you more. Just pray, Lord, that you would increase our affections for you, our true treasure. That you would remove the idols of our hearts that grow over time. That we wake up with, Lord. I pray that you would remove them in your name tonight. And that you would set our, our hopes, our dreams, our vision on what you've called us to do as your people, as your bride. Lord, we need you. We need your help. We need your help to wake up to do what you've asked us to do. We need your help to make the time to do what you've asked us to do. We need your help to have the right heart in doing what you've asked us to do, Lord. Everything that you call us to do requires all of us. And you know, Lord, that we cannot do it on our own. So now we're asking, Lord, for help from your Holy Spirit to come. To come to shape your people to be more like you. To do the things, to fulfill the things that you've called your bride to do. We love you, Lord. We possess this in your name. Never said, Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys for coming tonight. It's true. Uh, Mason did steal from Pastor John Piper to <laughs> give me a title for something to preach on. And uh, if you have a problem with Pastor John Piper, please uh, report all of your comments over to uh, Pastor Brian. He's going to ask to hear him. <laughs> 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 no, I will um, take a slightly different approach than uh, Pastor John, even though I love what he had to share on the subject, and he basically wrote an entire book on it. But I want to call into uh, attention our great commission here in the, the book of Matthew. And something that frustrated me, because I hadn't really seen it before, is that in the great commission seems to me that we don't hear any words from our Lord pointing to the motivation of our great commission to be to save souls. Save souls. Which is really interesting because when we think about the great commission, uh, even uh, especially churches who don't practice it too much, um, that's their end goal. It's the, the save soul the sinner. There's the three S's. <laughs> Save soul sinner. Um, but preceding these instructions that Jesus gives, there's worship right before this happens. They're worshiping at the feet of Christ. Because they know for sure, their eyes have seen, <laughs> that uh, he is who he said he is. He is the one. He is the one who defeated death. And they are worshiping him. Eh, some doubt it, which is uh, incredible to me. But I mean, I also haven't been through what the disciples went through. <laughs> that weekend. But here we have Jesus giving this command, reminding them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus owns it all. All authority in heaven and on earth. So he owns the whole earth, which is going to be important. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I'm sure we're pretty familiar with that verse. I know here at Wellspring we've heard this a time or two. But with the verse as clear as a guiding light to the hearts and actions of the body of Christ, what has happened? Why, why do we have a conference now to try to just gather as many as we can to hear about what we're called to do as the body of Christ? Really, the clearest command. Um, obviously, we have the laws of worshiping God and loving one another. But really, this command is so present in our minds as we think about, well, what did Jesus tell us to do? Well, I can think of one really big one, and that's a great commission. Um, and yet, our great commission is oddly absent in the hearts and minds of those who bear the name of Christ all around the globe. Well, um, I thought about this a lot. I thought about it as my own heart started to change several years ago, as I was one of those who liked the Great Commission, thought it sounded pretty nice, and was really happy that somebody out there was doing something about it. Uh, in 2018, the Barna Group found that one out of ten Christians shared their faith at least once a month. One out of ten. 
So as the church, we're tithing our faithful Christians. <laughs> one out of ten. <laughs> yeah, tuck that one in your pocket for later, right? I know you're going to use that again. <laughs> and two-thirds of Christians said that they had not shared their faith with anyone in the past year. Past year. Wow. That's incredible. What on earth has happened here? Well, uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing is we evangelize. Because there's a worship problem on the face of the earth. Uh, now you may be thinking you evangelize because Jesus told us to. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Jesus said it. That's enough. But there's a reason why Jesus said it. And that's because the new covenant is a mobile covenant. It goes out to the ends of the earth. It stretches across the globe. And we have a big problem as humanity, and that is we bear the image of God, and we hate him. We hate him. Jesus saw that as a problem as well. So he set forth to purchase people for his own worship and told us to go out and share the good news, fully knowing that there is a wide road and there's a narrow road. Right? Jesus wasn't... Jesus is not surprised the fact that we go out to the open air and we say repent and believe, and most people don't seem to like that very much. <laughs> However, as evangelicals over the past several decades, this seems to be a massive problem for us. We are doing it wrong. They're not receiving it well. They're not listening. You're not doing anything good. You're hurting the gospel. That's my favorite. As if these people were anywhere near being worshippers of Yahweh. And I came and said, repent and believe. And I somehow made them turn off by the whole idea. Um, we can look a little bit at our own church history. The book Strange Fire by Pastor John MacArthur troubling survey of evangelistic history in the formative years of the Pentecostal movement. Methodology spanning all the way from replacing the study of God's word and other languages, replacing that with an assumption that speaking in tongues has replaced working diligently to communicate the gospel. Methodologies from that all the way to utilizing pagan methods such as hypnosis and salesmanship to just get the sinner to mutter a few words that would lead to their salvation by having them call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah. Get you in there. I'm going to trick you into the gates of heaven. You said, I'll call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. He can't lie, and therefore we find a loophole. <laughs> don't have to repent, don't have to believe. Just say these words and you're in. <clears throat> but it's not just a Pentecostal problem, is it? We know our Reformed churches as well <clears throat> have a very difficult time splitting away from this presupposition the world must be ready to hear what we have to say. What is it? They don't care what you know until they know that you care? <laughs> well, one good way of showing that we care is by going out and sacrificing all social credit in order to spread the name of Christ. Amen. Where many churches and church cultures have gone wrong is by embracing the belief that we must sell Jesus in such a way to make him attractive to the dying world. Now, I don't know if you guys have read the Gospels, but Jesus didn't seem to be too concerned about being attracted to the dying world. Um, he did many things to fulfill many prophecies to show that he was the one that Israel was waiting for. However, he also saw it fit to turn away the crowds who were there for the wrong reasons. Where church grows in that technology, would say they're here for the wrong reasons, perfect. They'll learn the right reasons later. After we get them baptized and get them tithing and get them involved in youth groups. And, you know, the whole thing. What does that really communicate? What does that communicate? See, I hear many talking outside of Wellspring. You know, church, yeah, we're just not that great at evangelism. And I would say, it's not that churches aren't good at evangelism. In fact, they're good at anti-evangelism. That through what they teach and how they ignore our call to evangelize, they're actually teaching to not do it. Yeah. It's not just sectioning it off for later and say it's not important. We don't need to do this. And what's communicated is calling sinners to repent doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't do that. They don't like hearing those words. They're archaic, they're harsh, they're mean. Jesus is nice. 
They must know that Jesus will fulfill all their dreams, will get them out of hell. And they just need to believe that he exists. It's called sinister repent doesn't work. We will save them through other ways, including simply living a respectful life without needing to mention the name of Christ even once. They'll see my life, they'll see how much money I make, they'll see how nice I am. They will absolutely fall to the feet of the one whom they hate, according to Scripture. <laughs> we worship Him. It's just not true. It's not true. It's not biblical. It is far away. There is not a piece of the gospel that is not communicated <laughs> in how in the Acts of the Apostles. Granted, of course, we should be living lives that reflect the holiness of our Lord. Amen. But this generally is what has been communicated by evangelicalism as a whole for several decades. <clears throat> you should probably heard of them, that we have the stones to call ourselves evangelicals. Hmm. The very one thing that we are not doing. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe if we just call ourselves the good looking, it'll happen one day. <laughs> Apologize for that. Some of you have arrived. That's that's okay. (laughs) However, for the biblically minded souls who want to be obedient to the Great Commission, I really do believe that there are three general thoughts that we respond we respond with internally. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Number one, and, and I do think that. Uh, in my mind, this is levels of sanctification. So the, the first level, wow, I need, to share, I need to share my faith. I've been commanded by a Lord to share my faith. I need to go share my faith. Your thought is on the act, what I need to do. That's okay. It's okay to just have a conviction for what Jesus called you to do. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, and really, it should be enough for all of us that he said it. Amen. He said it. You shouldn't have to come up with an apologetic to defend the very clear teaching of Christ. Uh, and yet we see throughout all church history, and we see it today, um, the enemy is very busy twisting the words of Jesus to make him say the exact opposite of what he's saying. Number one, I need to share my faith. Number two, people need to be saved. Amen. So, so the first thought is, I need to go do this thing. Second thought is, oh, there's people out here. Who need to hear and be saved, who need to be pulled from the gates of hell, who need to be rescued. And evangelism is really the one thing that we're called to do, as far as worship goes, that have a time limit on. <laughs> People need to hear, they need to hear, they need to feel, they need to see. Number one, I need to share my faith. Number two, people need to be saved. And thirdly, and I think finally, Jesus must be worshipped. Amen. Jesus must be worshipped. He is worthy. He is worthy of all praise. Of all mankind. Amen. He must get it. He must get what he purchased, what was given to him. What the Father gave Jesus. All authority. He must be worshipped. So we start really close. My circle. I must do this thing that Jesus called me to do. He goes out and we start seeing other people. We start seeing it horizontally. People must be saved. And then finally, vertically, we leave earth for a second and realize Jesus must get what he is owed, the worship of all mankind. And so with the church methodology, methodologies of evangelism, quote unquote, that I discussed before that list, might tempt you if you think, oh, I need to share my faith, I will use these methods. If you're thinking, I need to share my faith and I need to do that as easily as possible, Maybe except for repent and believe, I'll say, Jesus loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, die for you. Die so you may experience freedom. I may use this less harsh terminology. Or maybe people need to be saved, so I need to offer the gospel in a way that they can hear it and receive it. And treasure it, and then we can clean up their theology later. I've heard it before, right? We don't, we, it's, not, it's not that I'm giving them wrong theology, just like giving, giving them 1% of it so that they can buy in the buying costs, and then they can be saved, and then they can grow and uh, get to the really iffy parts of the word. But if our brief supposition that Jesus must be worshipped, then none of none of those methods are even tempting to us. Amen. Even tempting to us. 
when I'm, when I'm out in the street, and I'm calling somebody to repent and to believe, I'm not interested in an exchange about what they think this world is all about. I'm not interested in trying to convince them, okay, if I can just convince them first that Jesus was real, then that's a win. It's not a win to me. It's not a win to me. I don't call it a win to get them to demon status, but believing that God exists. Okay, maybe a God exists out there somewhere. No, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in you just meeting me intellectually that the facts may or may not point to a creator. These things aren't wins. You want evidence? Open your eyes. Amen. Look at Christ. When's the last time you changed the world and how we measure time? <laughs> When's the last time you defeated death and ascended and changed the world before the internet existed? <laughs> changed the entire course of human history. When's the last time you did that? You did it. Because you don't own the world. You don't get to change the world by the word that you speak. Repent and believe today. Amen. I'm not asking you to look at God and to love him. I am commanding you through the word of my Lord to repent and believe so that you might be saved and that God is properly worshipped. Amen. But we've been taught that evangelism is about the sinner. No, it's not. But we are very happy that there is a side effect <laughs> to the Great Commission. That our souls are saved, that God shows mercy. God shows mercy. Where we walk someone through a sinner's prayer, that's a contract. That's not grace. It's not grace. There's a present, you just have to open it, right? <laughs> God gave you all the stuff, you just have to do that one thing. That, that is so present with every single false religion on the face of this planet. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus did all the stuff, but we open keys to the door to get to Jesus. Mormons, it's Catholicism, it's all of them. We hold, we have inherited the only faith where Jesus says, no, I saved you, and this is how I did it, and this is how I'm going to continue to do it, to do it through my bride. It's not supposed to be easy. We're like, let's make evangelism really easy, really palatable, we'll, we'll create this little timeline, this workflow of getting somebody saved. It doesn't work that way. The very method of the gospel that we speak openly, repent, believe, is designed to be foolishness to the world. Amen. Because God is showing his power in saving people through the foolishness. It's, we're, we're not supposed to be appealing to the intellect of the Greeks. We're not supposed to be appealing to the broken religion of the Jews. We're, we are countercultural, counter-human nature. And people are being saved. Why? Because it's God showing his very power in keeping us. Speaking to us, regenerating us. All right, I can't help. It. John six. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. John six is so beautiful. The people were following him. Everything was looking great. And Jesus turned them all away. <laughs> you don't want me. <laughs> Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And even though the disciples didn't understand either, where else are they going to go? <laughs> Their heart knows. Jesus is Lord. There's only one of him. There's nowhere else to go. They're not going to go to the Sanhedrin. They're not going to go to the Greeks. There's nobody else who is the way, the truth, and the life. You're it. I don't know what you just said, but I'm going to stick around. I have to. <laughs> like, the body, the flesh wants to go with them. Because that was weird. That was a weird sermon. <laughs> Very not seeker sensitive. You said stuff that I would never tell to my worst enemy. <laughs> And yet I'm here. I'm here. You have me. And guess what? When we share the gospel, it's the singing effect. Everything in me hates what you're saying. But who is Jesus? Who is this? Who is this? What, what are these words you're speaking? What is this peculiar glory that you hold? What is this hope you have in you? And are we ready? Because so, many, so, so often, I'm like, I'm going to go on the street, but uh, nothing good's going to happen out there. <laughs> uh, I remember thinking that. And uh, ultimately, something good happens all the time, and that is people are affected by the glories of God. Mm -hmm. the, the reprobate is stirred up by the law of the, God, the gospel, and they just hate it. 
something so powerful for so many thousands of years has stirred up once again image bearers of God who don't see and yet we're looking for the one that God grants sight to that they may hear and properly worship alongside the rest of his bride who has been redeemed for the word of God alone. Let's talk about the planet. According to Joshua Project, over 42% of our Earth is considered to be a reach. 42% a reach. It's pretty wild to think about. Half the world. Just about. Now, should the Lord tarry with America? Well, let's, let's just lock in here. A biblical America could and would be used so mightily by the Lord as an incredible force to knock that number down by an order of magnitude. And I'm, I'm speaking just as what we could put together with the blocks in front of us. But if the Lord saved this nation with what we have, the tools we have, the ability, the, the technology, like if our nation cared about reaching that group of people who have never heard the name of Jesus, Yahweh, never heard the law of God, the law of the the, of the one that they see in nature. We have, to, we have to think these ways. We have to care about what God does to America because we care about what God does for the unreached loss around the globe. Now, obviously, God can dispose of America and create the gospel in the sky for all to see. I mean, we don't want to presume upon how God will save this planet. <sighs> That said, he's given us a mind. He's given us diligence. Obviously, we use the praying press pretty well to spread the gospel. And so, there's no reason to believe God is continuing to use the progression of technology in order to save the people. It's not really what this is about. But we have to care about reaching our apostate nation. Um, if nothing else, we have to stop the false teachers from spreading their gospel before we can spread ours. Because we're exporting the, the prosperity gospel across the globe at, at a rapid pace. It's absolutely incredible how quickly false gospels go around. <clears throat> really, I say that to say this. We're not in a time of peace, so to speak. This is as it relates to wartime. We're not here to, to really just kind of find our life, live a, a good moral life, shaped by the Word of God, plant our flag in our homes, in our mansions, and just sit until we die. Now, I'll talk to my Reformed brethren for a second. <clears throat> How many of us have struggled with, well, if God is going to save all of his own, then what do I have to do? Anyone? I'm the only Calvinist who struggled with that one. <laughs> All right. Ever. Ever. Okay. Um, I had a funny thought. We don't do that with food, right? Like you're starving. Somebody brings you pizza. They're like, well, the Lord's going to feed me anyway because his plan can't be frustrated. I'm just going to lay down on the ground until that food makes it into my body. <laughs> we don't do that, right? You're hungry, so you go eat. So what I'm asking of God's church tonight is love God to go preach. Like be driven by something, right? This is not a really a strictly theological thing. Nothing truly is. But I'm not trying to get you to get on board with me that the world needs to, to worship God. I'm just saying let's acknowledge that and let's be praying that that drives us to do something. Now we're all going to be different pieces of the pie, right? You don't just have the street preachers doing all the work. They need support. They need prayer. They need good tracks. They need to be mobilized in a number of different ways, right? They need doctors to go with them. <laughs> uh, they need musicians to come. Uh, I love the, the, the Reformation and how Martin Luther said, Reformation wouldn't happen if it weren't for the music going to spread the land. The music was mobilizing the, the message of the Reformation. 
So we all have a piece to share. But really, as God's church, and we shouldn't be at this place, and I don't think you guys are necessarily, but the, the lay people who maybe aren't going to be directly connected to the face-to-face -face spreading of the gospel, especially across the globe, we have to have the same mind, the same goal. And I don't think we do. I really don't think the Church of God has the same goal for the world to see and worship Christ. I think there's the goal that we live peaceful lives. Mm -hmm. That we get what we need. And we share the gospel sometimes with our friends and family. And have a lot of coffee and die. <laughs> but if we can have that mind, and we can understand why we must evangelize our neighbor and our apostate nation, as well as trying to reach the rest of the world, we can actually have some unity in how we go about these things. Instead of constantly fighting online on why we're trying our best to be obedient to the gospel, pretty incredible. Maybe people could be supporting, cheering, asking how they can help, how they can participate as you know, the bride of Christ has been redeemed by the same gospel. We're trying to spread, right? I know, I'm just preaching to the choir. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to play a little table. <laughs> but uh, be praying for a militant desire that the only message that can save human soul would reach human souls. Like just have that that hunger that cannot be satisfied. Just have it, develop it, pray for it. Because we must have it. If we don't have a goal for how we are applying everything in our life, then we're just going to be confused on how to apply massive portions of Scripture talking about godly living and what for, what we're doing with it, what, what's our purpose. Evangelism is why we don't get saved and sucked up into the presence of the Lord. As much as I would have liked that to happen, Right? Cut down on all the sin that I've had since I was regenerated. That would have been amazing. However, God had a different plan, and that is that he mobilizes his redeemed to continue to participate in the work of that redemption all across the globe. All across the globe. Friends, salvation from sin, death, and hell is of Israel versus the world. New covenant, it's all fair game. Instead of going to slaughter our enemies, we go to give them a message of redemption. And there is a greater death for them than being slaughtered if they reject Christ and the gospel, for sure. However, we are called to love our enemies. What's the best way to love our enemies? To give them the only message that could possibly save them. Possibly save them. Today's the day of unfolding the reality that the word of God will captivate the sinner who has been given years to hear. We are, we are believers who live within the joy of the new and greater covenant that Jesus purchased for his people. And we joyfully sing and shout our way to the grave, knowing that not even death can separate us from the love of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. The people driven by the fear of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Keep us holy, keep us happy. <laughs> keep us going. Keep us moving, understanding that left in our sin is judgment. But even just today, even us meeting here today, and really not having to fear anybody, is just a mercy to, to God's church. Right? So yeah, the world has a worship problem. We want to see them worshiping God. And isn't it just so precious to worship alongside the saints? Isn't that just amazing? I studied a little bit of music in college, and really music just blows down to a bunch of different weird vibrations that happen to sound good uh, together. <laughs> Got our major chords and our minor chords, and nobody actually knows how any of it works. We're just <laughs> observing it, it's like, oh, that sounded good, oh, that sounded bad, write that down. You know? <laughs> we have these rules that we receive from God as he baked music into his world. And we sing out to that God with that music that he gave us. Mm -hmm. It is just such a beautiful thing to worship. Alongside. Mm -hmm. And my goal is the same behind that piano or behind the guitar as it is out there. I want to see worship happen. Amen. Leading people in worship. You guys can do that as you spread the gospel. This is how you worship God. Follow what He said to do. This is worship. It's an act of worship. The Great Commission is commanding people to worship, not just believe. Amen. 
want my people to worship, and I want to add to my people worshipers. The world has forgotten its creator. The church has forgotten her first love. So let's be praying for mercy, pray for the joy of the Lord, pray that we would have right thinking. There's so many that bear the name of Christ are sudden, they're just, they think they're experts. Well, I don't really know what we should do, but not what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. um, we must be right in our thinking. And I think God is doing the work today. Uh, and, and it's been skewing, it's been growing. There's heat here. There's heat here in Southern Oregon for people who are interested in doing the hard thing because they know it's what God has commanded of us. Mm -hmm. And there's, I think, a measure of full glory on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. And we, we must mourn that the church at large has been taught not to evangelize, specifically not to do exactly what we're called to do. And we must be patient, bear patiently. There are many who belong to God, I believe, who aren't getting it, who, don't, who have some of the box on their mind that have been set in there from false teaching. And they need to see it. They need to see it. They need to see us growing in numbers and power and in obedience. And, and we just pray one day they'll see it and go, oh, yeah, that's what I'm called to do by my Lord and my Savior. I just, I can't let go of this vision of the saved America. <laughs> so many who claim and who still receive the Bible at some level, like if they just got it, they just got it, the power the power, it would rival the Reformation. Mm. It would rival what happened as, uh, as we came and preached over this side of Great Britain. Probably overcome. So be filled with hope, church. We love our Lord. We want others to love our Lord. It can be as simple as that. It really can be. And uh, the more we evangelize, the more we realize that man is... Nothing to be afraid of. Really. I mean, honestly, if they wanted to kill you, you win, right? Who said it? Don't threaten me with glory. <laughs> uh, we just we, we win. That's the joy of the Lord, is that we are secured. Secured by, by our Lord. And it's just a wonderful, beautiful thing. I really do believe providentially we're having conferences like this in the last several years, growing precursor to a mighty work that the Lord has already started in our midst, really, truly. Uh, I'm a part of that fruit, as being somebody who received this, hated it, but knew, uh, I've been had, right? It's in the word. <laughs> I have to listen. I have to pay attention. And I think there's many more of me out there um, who need to be pressed on this. Um, because the false teaching goes in and satisfies all of the pain uh, associated with with reading about the Great Commission, you just need to rip out, rip out the false teaching. Keep working. Bear patiently with God's pride. Um, and let's just see what the Lord is going, going to do. Because um, nothing can stop this. If this is what God wants, nothing is stopping. And this is what we're proving to the world, right? It's like, okay, you're giving us everything that you have in your arsenal. And as you guys see on the street, it's a lot of crazy stuff hmm. they have in their arsenal. There's nothing. Nothing compared to what we have. The one in us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. And we get to see that firsthand. We get to understand some scriptures firsthand when we go out and spread the gospel. Amen. And it really is a wonderful thing. All right, so uh, I'll just go and pray. Let's wrap up. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. Lord, I just pray you would be our predominant treasure our reward, our goal, and our heart to be in your presence to see you worship rightly. Lord, these desires are so foreign to the world and unfortunately are foreign to, to many churches. And I just pray supernaturally, Lord, that you continue to draw us to understand, to, to deny our sin, to deny ourselves, to deny our own dreams, but to understand that our true and lasting joy and love comes from serving you and being in your presence. Lord, you have designed us to serve you, to worship you, to belong to you, be slaves of righteousness. And only when we are operating how we were designed 
Will we find that joy that we all so desperately want? Lord, we see in your word at the very beginning of all things, the creation is properly ascribing glory to you. And at the end of all things, creation will once again properly describe all glory to you. So Lord, here in the weird and immediate period, let us be found faithful to the call. Let us see you. Let us love you. Let the world see that we actually think that this is a matter of eternal life and death. Mm. Let them know that your church believes your word. Because right now they don't know that about us. But Lord, I just pray that you would stir many more to see clearly. You would call many more to yourself. Mm. And Lord, I thank you that those who are saved on the street don't have that stumbling block as they come to know you. <laughs> they know that your people are doing what we must do in order to see them worshiping you. Give us a, a godly boldness, confidence in your word, in your power. Lord, let us appreciate that you choose the foolish things of the world to show yourself. You, you, you shame the wise with the foolish. And you shame the strong with the weak. And uh, Lord, I just thank you that you love me enough to make me foolish to this world. That you took away my desperate need to be smart to those who hate you. You gave me a greater desire to be counted wise among the saints, to see, to know. And that God, I just love these people. Pray that you bless all who are here tonight. Pray that you bless our time fellowshipping and eating. Bless our conversations. Lord. Let us be bolstered. Let us be so filled with a, a joy and a holy fire to do your work. Make us zealous to do the things of our Father. Be about your work. And uh, our fill us with joy. Continue to sanctify us, Lord. Forgive us of all our sin. Set our hearts and our minds on you. I uh, love you. We just these things in your name. Amen. 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 David stepped up to preach here for our SOEC. It was a blessing to have him do that. So it's awesome. He's been last couple years helping out with worship. That's Brian doing that. So it's uh, great to have him up on here preaching to us. So. Well, now we get the blessing of breaking bread together. So I want to say right off the bat, thank you to Janet, whoever else she put together to uh, provide food for us. So we who are here, plus the community here, are going to go and eat lasagna. So before we do that, let's say a quick prayer and ask a blessing on that. We'll be back here in about an hour, and we'll get at some more. Father, I thank you again for this day. What a blessing it has been to be out in the fields of souls, and what a blessing it is to come back here, just like David said, where we're free still, where we don't have to worry about people coming after us, where we can come and worship the King who saved us, and be encouraged to seek others to worship you. Lord, thank you so much for the message you gave us through David. Let us be a people who remember you commanded us to worship, and we rejoice in being able to do that. We're thankful that we get to know the God, and worship the God of heaven and earth, the God who sent his only begotten son to die to save us and raise again and see you forever right there by your side, interceding on our behalf, loving on us forever. Thank you again so much for your amazing grace towards us. Bless this food the rest of this evening. I ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.